We'll read from two passages uh, this evening. Our text will be coming from James chapter 1 again, but first of all, 1 Corinthians 15, the verses 20 through 28. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he will deliver the kingdom of God to the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And then turn to James chapter 1, and then we'll start reading that verse 12. Keeping in mind that James is a book that is written to encourage believers who are undergoing trials in a world that is in opposition to Jesus Christ. James 1, chapter tw- uh, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Let us pray. Almighty, triune God, we thank you that you reveal yourself to us as our Father who made all things and who provides for us all things necessary that we might serve him, who has provided for us his Son. We thank you that you have revealed to us Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whom we have been released from the guilt of our sins, in whom we have been designed for a life of fellowship with you. And we thank you for the God of all comfort. We thank you that you reveal yourself to us as the God who unites us together in your church, preparing us for an eternity of fellowship with you. Father, as we are looking forward to that day when all things shall be made new. We know that we are yet in this life where there is so much that is in opposition to you. And so we pray that you will strengthen us. Give us understanding of your word. Give us understanding of how you would have us live in the midst of these trials, tribulations, that we might be radiant witnesses for you. As Christ is light, so let us be light in this dark world and help us to bring glory to you. Grant us understanding, keep us from straying thoughts and sleepiness as we hear your word proclaimed, 
and may your name be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our text that we're focusing on is verse 18 of his own will. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Your people of God are called to be saints. This morning, we considered the blessing of a God who is forever faithful to his character, who is for us a perpetually faithful Father in Jesus Christ, who is working in everything for the good of those who love him. And that doesn't change. In our various trials and all the accompanying temptations, it is a marvelous blessing to have a God who is always forgiving, always loving, always pulling us to himself, to his gracious fellowship. And this gracious, saving character of God is emphasized in verse 18, which we just read. Or as the ESV would put it, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. James is helping us in this world of trial and temptation. And in this section of James chapter 1 is really contrasting God with the idols of this world. With where our sinful desires would want to take us. Here is what God is like, he says. He is not like that man in verse 8 who doubts, who's tossed to and fro, who's fickle. No, God is ever faithful. He continues the contrast, telling us that while our sinful desires bring forth death, God, the creator of lights, is forever faithful sovereignly giving us life and light. James us is reminding us that God is the one who is bringing us, who is reconciling us to himself. And the thing that really strikes me here is that this is a book about salvation by grace alone. Now, not a lot of people would think about that when they think about James, because they think of James as a book all about works and how we are supposed to live. And indeed, if you continue on through the book of James, there's a lot about how we should be living as people redeemed. But before he gets to any of that, he emphasizes that salvation is from the Father of lights. That creation is all of God. And look at his words in verse 18. Of his own will, in the next phrase, he brought us forth. That's the sovereign grace that you actually find throughout all of Scripture. It's not because of us. It's not because we were so intelligent that we could understand this. It's not because we in any way deserve salvation. It's not because we've been raised in this church that teaches very good things and has great community. The reason we were saved is not that. God definitely uses means. But at the end of the day, 
The only reason we are saved is because of his own will he brought us forth. That's it. Very simple words. God saves sinners. The gospel is not sinners. Salvation is possible if only you would take it. If only you would do something about it. No. God saves sinners. Of his own will, he brought us forth. God's grace to us in Jesus, told in the gospel, is primary. It's all about what he has done on our behalf. How he acts sovereignly to care for us. To take us out of the darkness into light. To take us out of a state of sin and misery and to bring us into the newness and the fullness of everlasting fellowship with him in the new heavens and the new earth. If somebody asks you, what is the gospel? What is the promise of the gospel? You say, well, there is life in Christ. There's forgiveness of sins and there's life in Christ. Yes, it's more. That life implies, of course, there will be a new heavens and a new earth. It's the essence of the gospel. We are, if you read the book of uh, Ephesians, it's all about how God is creating a new, com uh, creating a new community called the church, preparing them for the new heavens and the new earth. We are the bride. He's shaping in the image of Christ until we all grow up to maturity. Sometimes we have those days when we wish we could start over. And God is the God who would say to us, I'm the one who gives the fresh starts. I'm the one who gives new life, where sin gives death. And why? God would say, because I'm pleased to do so. He loves to forgive. He loves to show mercy. It's a glorious truth. That is who God is. Every good and perfect gift comes from him, comes from above. And, and we shouldn't twist our minds up into all kind of knots as to, well, why does God choose to save us? Why does God choose to come to us in his sovereign grace? I'm glad he does. And one thing is true is that it should make us rejoice. It should make us lift our hearts in worship that he would do this for us. If we sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. <laughs> At first, that, that should be sweet to us. He brought us forth. He did it. Planned it from eternity and in time. He did it and he's doing it. And he doesn't change. What he's begun, he finishes. He's got a perfect plan and his plan is to, fa is to save failures and wrecks like you and me. But notice what he says the means for this is. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Um, if you're anything like our church, well, we have Sunday school, two church services on Sunday, and then we have Wednesday night Bible studies, and, and then we have Monday Bible studies, and then we have other 
Bible studies that go on in the church. And uh, we spend a lot of time in the Word. We spend a lot of time with preaching. And not only that, we, we, we spend a lot of time getting involved in the community to make sure the message gets out. Uh, you're having a ministry at the Mumfest. Some of you are involved in, in um, pregnancy center, I understand. And um, you support church plants, missionaries. Why? Well, because you understand something. The word brings forth life. Our desires are always making us think about things that have power. We, we want something that is going to do something for us. And we think if we have this, if we do this, then I'm more fulfilled, more whatever it may be. Well, you want to know where true power is found? Take up your Bible and read and see the changes that take place in you. That word of truth language means everything God has revealed, everything God has revealed, including what James is writing. It's everything he has given us for life and godliness. This is the means he has chosen. It all points to Christ, and Christ personifies it beautifully, and all of it leads us to the knowledge of the triune God. This is the means he uses to save us and to bring us into fellowship with himself. And James, James is saying, it's very simple. How are we saved? Well, the gospel is proclaimed. And we hear it. And hearing it, we believe it. And we are saved. All because God, of his own will, brings us forth through that word of truth. And that's why we spend so much time with the Bible. That's why missionaries and supportive missionaries those who support them on the field, are so crucial in our times. Who's going to get the message to the Muslims? Who's going to save those who have no interest in God or his people? Is it going to be us and our clever designs? No. I mean, we should think carefully. We should think strategically. I have no, no problem there. But at the end of the day, we understand the reason anyone gets saved is because of God's sovereign grace working through his word. James says that is how God saves us, through the word of truth. Now, the purpose of God's willing to bring us forth, bring us to faith, new birth, is that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And that language is very significant. The first fruits, as we understand, were the first part of the crop. Firstborn of the animals, people. And they belong to God. Also, the first fruits spoke of future harvest. The term first fruits took on symbolic meaning in the prophets who spoke of Israel as being the first fruits of God's harvest, holy unto the Lord, Jeremiah chapter 2. In other words, Israel is the first of God's harvest.
Paul uses this language in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus is the first fruits from the dead. And here James is saying that as Christians, we are the first fruits of all creation, or of all creatures. And he said, who's right? Of course, all of them. All of them are right. Because the Son took on flesh and gave his life and rose from the dead as our representative, he was the first fruits from the dead. The first to rise back to fellowship with God. And in him, that's Paul's description of Christians, in him, the Old Testament believers who were the first fruits and us are united to him by faith alone. We are a part of the first fruits of the harvest that began with Christ's resurrection. And yet, stay with me here. Here's the structure for hope in the New Testament. Three steps that James picks up on here. We need hope as we go through trials and through temptations, right? Sinful desires in the midst of trials and temptations well up within us. And they, they promise to fulfill our desires and our needs. And James says, no, have nothing to do with those. Accept no substitutes. He reminds us of who God is. And he says, you in Jesus Christ are the first fruits of what God is doing in the world. Keep this in mind. You are devoted to God. And he says, if you want to know, know how to have hope, here's the threefold structure. Look back to Jesus, the first fruits. God raised him from the dead and raised him to glory. And all things are in submission to him. His resurrection and his ascension you'd say, is the turning point. If you want to understand where the New Testament gains its center and everything that flows out of it theologically, it's there at the resurrection and ascension of Christ. That's why Paul spends so much time talking about these things. It's why James uses the first fruits language. So the first step is we look back to Christ, the first fruits. And then secondly, in the present, we enjoy God's exhaustible grace here. God is the Father of lights, who continually gives us all things that are good in order to bring us into that life and freedom that comes in Christ. With this harvest that he's bringing to fruition. And the third step is that then we look forward to the day that the harvest will be complete. Jesus said, the Son of Man will send out his angels to the four winds, and they will begin to reap the harvest. Now understand, that's not just before the end comes. We are living right now in the middle of that reaping. Christians are a part of that harvest and God looks at Christians, he looks at us with all of our flaws, at all of our wrong responses at times to trials and temptations, at all of our sinful desires, and he said, here, here is the crop I am harvesting. This is my crop in Christ. He is bringing us forth. He's working in our lives. He's working in our trials. He's recalibrating our desires so that we will desire a better harvest and that through us others will see and they too will be brought into this harvest. Better harvest than what any of our sinful desires can give us. They only lead to death. Everything other than God cheats us of life. There's no first fruits in sin because the wages of sin is death. God is reaping a harvest of righteousness through Jesus Christ by faith alone through all of us. 
There is a further dimension here we must understand. James says we are the first fruits of all he created. And this is something we often forget. And that is God's love is not just to zap us out of this world so that he can destroy this earth and we will live in the skies like some cartoons have floating on the clouds. No, from the very beginning, God took pleasure in all that he had made and he promises to renew everything. We will live in a renewed heavens and earth. Paul says in Romans 8, the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed, that is, to be brought forth. For the creation was subjected to frustration by the will of the one who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought forth into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Romans 8, that beautiful chapter. It's this of which Paul speaks in his marvelous chapter on election when he explains that God's plan is to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. That's what Peter talks about when he says we're looking forward to a new or literally renewed heavens and earth. Through Christ, once God's people, you would say, are gathered in, all things will be made new. As we go through trials, we must see that these trials are just part of the great plan God has to shape us as he makes all things new. In fact, we are new creations ourselves. We're the first fruits of a new creation. And this per perspective adds vision and hope. I say, what an amazing grace. Not just that I'm forgiven, but that I'm part of such an amazing plan of God where for all eternity we will be in fellowship in the new heavens and the new earth. So we can take away from this at least two things. There's more, but at least two things. First, the absolute sufficiency of God's generous grace. All of us run after sinful desires because they do promise to meet a need. The approval of people, for instance, make us or promise to make us feel that we belong. Money promises to make us secure. A boyfriend or a girlfriend promises to meet the need for companionship. Maybe another spouse promises to meet a need that's lacking with the present one. All our desires promise to meet a need. And for all the many ways they may show up in our lives, the one thing they all have in common is that they are constantly shouting at us, God's grace is not sufficient for you to be satisfied. So look at these other things. Find your pleasure, find your satisfaction in other places. And James comes to us and he says, no. God's grace in Jesus Christ is the only thing that's enough. It's the only thing, it's the one thing that meets our deepest desires because it brings us into an eternal fellowship with a triune God. 
Look at it this way. All the idols we chase kill us through our desires. Only the gospel shows us a God who dies to change our desires. Everything else kills us through desires. Only the gospel gives us a God who dies to change our desires to Christ and in him to give us all things. What is, he, what is God up to in our life tonight? In the many circumstances in which we find ourselves, he's bringing us back to himself from wherever we've been. He is saying to us, I am worthy of all your love and all your worship and all your trust. You've given it away. You've given it to other lovers and they have failed to satisfy you. But tonight I'm pursuing you. I sent Jesus to the cross to the point of death and raised him to glory and sent the Spirit, and I gave you my word to give you new life and to sanctify you to be like Jesus. Because unless your heart changes, a sinful desire is to have a greater desire for what is greatest. I should say that better differently. The only thing that changes a sinful desire is to have a greater desire for what is greatest, and that is Jesus. It is the, only the gospel of the cross that can crush our petty, life-stealing, death-dealing desires that entrap us, enslave us, and make our lives dull, make our worship dull, make us indifferent about the gospel, make us grumpy and irritated. God comes to us and said, I am enough. And when you learn that about me, you'll realize you don't need to desire anything else because I am the one who ultimately meets all of your needs. You may think, I don't know. I don't know if I can transfer all of my trust from what I can see and taste and touch to a hope of a new heaven and a new earth, of fellowship with the triune God. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Whoever seeks his life will lose it. Whoever is willing to lose it for Christ's sake We'll find it. And what that does to us after we begin to understand the generous nature of God, well, it, it ought to do a few things for us. Do you struggle with, it, struggle with impatience? Because you want things on your timetable? We sometimes think we know better how to run the world than God does. We kind of want America fixed today. We kind of want the church fixed today. That kind of a thing. Our children fixed up immediately or that kind of a thing. But if we understand God's generous grace, his great plan of redemption from before the foundation of the world through time until the very end, if we realize that no matter in Christ, no matter how often we fail, he still pursues, he never gives up, he is patient with you, with me. Well, doesn't that then make us more patient with each other? Don't give up on the person who you think is a lost cause. Whether it's a family member, just a friend, or a coworker, maybe you're the person. We're not going to give up on you. 
Christians don't give up on anybody because they know the sovereignty of grace is the only thing that saved them. And they have no claim to it. And they know that grace alone can change anybody, anywhere, anytime. And that should make us patient with each other, with anyone. And it should make us much more outward focused instead of just focused in on ourselves. Trials tend to make us self-absorbed. We're all concerned about what we're going through. And when we're going through trials, we want everybody to think about us, take pity on us, support and help us. But when we remember what God is really doing in and through our trials, and we are part of the first fruits of a whole new creation, then the focus shifts, doesn't it? Then we begin to realize we're part of a whole mission here to bring in the harvest. Then we seek to help others see who God is and gain this vision, to look to God and find that same hope and same vision we have. Our light and our momentary troubles are achieving for us a far greater glory. And so we fix our eyes on what is unseen, not seen, for what is unseen is eternal. And this is something we want, all those who still live by sight, to see. When we see that God is gracious, is there anything more amazing to tell people? When you watch what happens, again, another full week of headlines that are horrific, and you wonder, what's going to happen next? What, what do people need? What they need to know is the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And nobody has that story other than we who are saved by grace alone. There is no other God who dies to change their desires than the God of the Bible. There's only one way of salvation. Nobody invents an idol that's gracious. Idols only enslave. That's why this is so important. That's why we need this outward focus. And when that happens, and it happens in a community like this of believers, something else happens that's marvelous, that's wonderful. When we get a gospel of God's generosity and grace to us, we become a whole lot more willing to enter into each other's mess. The problem is, I understand this, we don't like people knowing our mess. I really don't want you to know my mess, okay? But the gospel says about me, everything isn't fine. Okay, now you know it. If you understand the gospel, it makes us see our mess and what Jesus has done to make us whole. And then it makes us willing to enter into and realize that, well, we all got a mess. <laughs> And we can enter into each other's mess with humility and maybe with fear, but also with some boldness. Humility, because when you go to someone who's breaking apart, our response is one of sharing in the mess, because we too are saved by grace alone. All of us are capable of any sin, and it's only because of the generous nature of God who has shown us grace and still has grace to give, that we don't. We can go and we can talk with each other and we can minister to each other with boldness because we have the expectation that God will work by his word and by his spirit. Do we believe that nobody has gone too far for God to work? I mean, he saved us. 
the God who made the sun and the moon and the stars, who planned and predestined everything from your next breath to the orbit of the planets, well, we haven't seen some of those planets yet. Do you think we ought to be expectant that he will act and work through us as we bring his word to light in this world? Generous grace changes us. It changes churches. It changes individuals. It changes how we live together. And it will renew this groaning creation into an eternal dwelling place for God with his people. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your generosity in giving us your best when we give you our worst. We thank you that we will never exhaust your patience or your care for us. We hear that you will never give up, but that your grace is everlasting. Thank you. You are great and greatly to be praised. Bless us as we go forth from here. Bless us now as we uh, celebrate together the sacrament where we will dwell upon that great gift of grace that is ours in the death of Jesus Christ and the fellowship that we have with you through him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.